Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Burns Memorial United Methodist Church. It's so good to see you all. Isn't it wonderful to be where you can sing and worship God with your fellow Christians on Sunday mornings? It doesn't matter at all if we're a little warm today because we're here with each other and we'd be warm in the heart anyway, just out of love for each other. Let's stand, please. Our call to worship, the traditional call to worship from, from Psalm 51. And I'll read the light print if you all read the dark print. Oh Lord, open my lips. And my mouth shall show them. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Amen. And let us pray together. Dear Lord, we are thankful again that we can gather with your people this morning. That we can add our, our voices to the hymns and our thoughts and heart to the prayers. Lord, we're grateful to be here. We pray that as we gather to worship here, that you might meet us. We know of your promise that where two or three gather in your name, there you are. And so we pray and trust that you'll meet us today with your presence and with your love and with your spirit. We pray this in your name. Amen. As you remain standing, we'll sing our uh, hymn, 10,000 Reasons. standing let's unite in the historic confession of the Christian faith the words are printed in the bulletin I believe, believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth and, and in Jesus Christ his, his only son, son our Lord who was, who was conceived, conceived by, by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, crucified dead, dead and buried the third day he rose from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 And before taking your seat, would you over take a few steps if you need to and greet two or three people somebody you haven't talked to yet today Well, as you wander around and find your seat and quit talking and all that stuff, again, good morning to everyone. It's good to be here. Uh, not very many things uh, to be said. Uh, of course, our Bible studies are uh, starting to start up, and uh, we'll, we'll be doing the Zoom again and, and the Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, Bible study, so keep that in mind. Uh, the daycare needs uh, some volunteers, so if you know anybody or if you could yourself uh, volunteer uh, for the uh, daycare, so that is something that's needed. Uh, other than that, as you see everything in your bulletin about the Monday movers and, and, uh, and the things that are uh, scheduled here in the bulletin. And as I uh, sometimes forget to say, and I'll, I would ask you to repeat it, that God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. Thank you. <coughs> now, if you'll remain seated, and we will sing uh, the wonders of it all. There's the wonder of sunset. At evening, the wonders at sunrise I see, but the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul, the wonders that God loves me, oh, the wonders of it all, the wonders of it all, just to think that God loves me. Wonders of it all, the wonders of it all, just to think that God loves me. There's a wonder of springtime and harvest, the sky, the star, the sun. But the wonders of wonders that thrill my soul is a wonder that only begun all oh, the wonders of it all the wonders of it all just to think that God loves me all oh, the wonders of it all the wonders of it all just to think that God loves me
Amen. And thank you to Harold. Bruce is out of town this morning. He uh, drove uh, his mother, who's been with us the last couple weeks, he drove her back to, uh, back to Louisiana on Friday and spent Saturday there and is on his way back, I think, today. And God bless and watch over him as he travels. Uh, speaking of, of people to, to ask for prayer for, let's be mindful of the, the many in Kentucky who are, are struggling today. At last I heard is that there are over 25 confirmed deaths with the flooding and flash flooding in Kentucky and tens of uh, thousands of homes that have been destroyed and businesses destroyed along those, those uh, small river valleys that, that flooded. And so let's remember them. Also, uh, let's continue to pray for those who are recovering uh, from procedures. Irby, who's, uh, I think, if he's not home yet, he's due to come home soon. Uh, Mike, our pianist, we're thankful to have him back and doing well this morning. And, and uh, uh, Mark Godfrey on the back row had a procedure last week and spent uh, a little time at the hospital. We're glad that he's back with us today as well. Uh, the prayer today is from... Uh, printed in the bulletin, it's from Francis of Assisi, and it's a prayer about uh, us being used by God to make a difference in other people's lives. It's a favorite prayer of mine. Let's bow our heads and we'll read it together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith where there is despair hope where there is darkness light and where there is sadness joy O divine master grant that i may and so much seek to be consulted as to console to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love for it is in giving that we receive and it is pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is dying that we are born to eternal life. Gracious Lord, we lift our hearts and minds unto you today, and we do pray that you would continue to make all of us instruments of your peace, that whatever our age might be, our station of life, wherever we work or go to school at, that we might be used by you to show your love in the world around us. Lord, help us to reach out with your compassion in our communities. We pray, Lord, for your wisdom and your guidance on us as we go through each day. We pray especially for those of our community who are recovering. We ask your continued blessings on Mike and, and Irby and Mark and others whom we know that, that have had procedures recently and are in need of your, of your prayers. We ask your blessing on Leona's brother, who's in the hospital at the VA, that you might give him the daily strength that he needs. Dear Lord, we lift up all those people in Kentucky, and we just ask that those who are, are ministering to them in your name, that they might have your, your guidance and direction and, and minister out of your love. We pray for all those hurting families and for the communities and the government, not just that, that they might recover but that this kind of tragedy might be prevented in the future. We continue, Heavenly Father, to lift up our president and Congress and the leaders here and around the world. We ask that you give wisdom, that you raise up peacemakers, and that your people around the world might be one. We lift up this prayer in the name of the Christ who taught us all to pray by saying, Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy name. Thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread. And, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as, as we forgive those who trespass against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation but, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, and the glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion 
be understood. All I have to offer him was poor goodness and strife, but he made something beautiful in my life. Something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was boldness and strife, but he made something beautiful of my life. Well, every day is a gift, isn't it? We're, we're happy to be here and happy that, that everybody makes it back to their seats okay after singing in the choir. We're going to be thankful for all the little blessings. Uh, in, the, uh, in the program on the back, it mentions prayer meeting. What I'd like to have happen sometime is to have a gathering of people who want to pray about our fall and this coming year. Uh, kind of an informal gathering where we might pray in silence for a while and then ask people to share what the Lord is sharing with you about our plans. You know, we're, we're coming up. In fact, we're almost there on the fall of a year. And, and, and I kind of think of our church years as, as September to, to May, you know, kind of like a school year. Uh, but I was hoping in the next week or two to, to have a meeting. And so if you see that there on the back of the, the program, if that's something of interest with you, if you would email me or text or call, and we'll try to find a time that, that meets, meets uh, that we could all meet together at and, and uh, uh, meet and pray and 
you know, this is the Lord's church, and, and I believe that the Lord will lead us more as we lean more on him for leadership. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Our scripture today is from the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. And I'm reading today from the New International Version. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my... I'm sorry. Oh, please stand for the reading of God's word. Thank you, Harold. Oh, there we go. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store all my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Then I will be able to store all my grain and my goods. Then I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared up for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up for things for himself, but is not rich toward God. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. Please be seated. And I, uh, looking at the program, I think I skipped something. We have a video clip. You ready with that, Jordan? It must be the heat. It's kind of confusing. Generosity comes in many forms. Our time, our help, our kindness, and our resources. But here's what we know the Bible teaches us. When God's blessing comes to us, it must also go through us. So, what would it look like for you this year to be generous? A timely gift? A helping hand? An act of kindness? Prosperity isn't meant to raise our standard of living, but to raise our standard of giving. Abundance isn't meant for us to live in luxury, but for us to help others live. And generosity isn't just something God wants from us, but something God wants for us. When Jesus came to save the world, he didn't ask, what can I spare? Instead, he asked, what will it take? So, what would it look like for you this year to be generous? And the scripture there at the end was uh, where, your, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you like these videos we've been playing in church? I think I'm going to get you all used to them and then I'll just put on a video and I'll sit down and we'll have a whole sermon video. <laughs> no, I, I like to preach. I think it's a privilege to be able to, to share with you all uh, the sermons, but I think the videos are, are a help. Most of you all would remember a comedian named Jack Benny, kind of a Jerry Seinfeld. Anyone heard the name Jack Benny before? Some of y'all haven't, I know, but he was a Jerry Seinfeld type of person in the middle of the 20th century. And in one skit, he's walking down the street and somebody holds him up, sticks a gun at him and says to him, your money or your life. Well, there's no immediate response from Jack Benny in the skit. He, he pauses, and, and there's, he, it's a long silence. And after a while, the, the, the would-be thief says again, well, what's it going to be? Your money or your life? And Jack Benny says, be patient. I'm thinking, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking. It's easy to think that it's all about money, that life is all about money. And it's amazing to me how little the world has changed 
in 2,000 years. And so in our gospel today, Luke 12, someone in the crowd says to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus says, uh, <clears throat> he says, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator? And he says, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. The New Living, New Living Translation says, life is not measured by how much you own. The late Eugene Peterson's translation in the message says that life is not defined on what you have, even when you have a lot. So then Jesus tells him this parable about the very, very successful farmer and he has so much, he doesn't know where to keep it all. He says, I'm gonna tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Then I'm gonna eat, drink, and be merry. This guy's lived the American dream. He's a successful, wealthy businessman. Next up for him ought to be to, to buy a house in the Hilton Head or, or you know, at least a timeshare down in Hilton Head. Uh, maybe Robin Leach could interview him for the lifestyles of the rich and famous. But instead of praise, God calls him a fool. That's a hard word, isn't it? He calls him a fool. And then the, the wealthy, successful farmer dies that night, and Jesus has that question, whose then will be this grain that you've stored up for yourself? The question today is, why is he a fool? What can we learn here so that we're not fools, and so that we, uh, so the Lord doesn't use this word to refer to us. I think there are at least four reasons why he, he, uh, he made a poor decision. And I'm going to list my four. And if, if the Lord moves you and you have some other thoughts uh, at the end of the service, if you want to come on up and share reasons five, six, or seven, feel free to do so. But let me go through this. First off, he's a fool because he has no gratitude. In, the, uh, in, the, in, in my translation, it says that this man utters 60 words. None of his 60 words were the word thank you. There are a lot of ways he could have said it. He could have said donka or thank you or merci or grazie or, or those other ones on the bottom. But he had no thank you there at all. No thank you. This is a farm story. And some of you all have farming relatives and been around farms. And you know that farming is a risky business. You need the right weather to put the crop in and dry enough uh, water in the ground so you want, wanted some, some rains before planting, but then dry enough to plant, and then sunshine and rain through the growing season with hopefully no tornadoes and no, no hail damage. And then in the fall, you need dry weather again to harvest and hopefully not an early winter coming in to, to cause any problems with that, an early snow. It's a risky business. In fact, it's hard to understand uh, how so many have been able to make a living at it for so long. It's just so much at chance with farming. Yet with this business as uncertain as it is, he still doesn't have a word of gratitude. He uses the words I or my 15 times among his 60 words, but never once thank you. Friends, I, I think that might be one of the reasons the Lord calls him a fool. He's not grateful. In the musical Godspell, there's a beautiful hymn of gratitude. We plow the fields and scatter the good seed on the land, but it is fed and watered by God's almighty hand. He sends us snow in winter, the warmth to swell the grain, the breezes and the sunshine, the soft, refreshing rain, all good gifts around us are sent from heaven above. Then thank the Lord, thank the Lord for all his love. Amen. Godspell, beautiful, musical. The Hebrew word for thank you, by the way, if you're going to add to this list, is yada. It sounds like ta-da, but it's yada. And, and it's a play off the word hand, which is the Hebrew word yad. It's as if you're taking something. If I was thankful for my coffee here, I'm sorry, we don't have enough for everybody. But I would be whole, taking my hand and raising it up and saying, saying yada, thank you, Lord for this and all the other blessings of life. This farmer might have had a different story had he had a little bit of gratitude. You ever think for a minute how, how things could be different, that it's by God's grace that our families are blessed, that our kids are doing well, it's by our grace that we have friends, have a church to be a part of, that we have homes to sleep in, that we didn't 
have the damage that so many people in Kentucky are, are struggling with today. You ever think how different life could be and how we have indeed been blessed by God? Amen? Amen. I think gratitude is, is A, maybe the, but certainly one of the big defining characteristics of Christians. We are the thankful people. I like these quotes by G.K. Chesterton. He said, when it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or whether you take things with gratitude. Chesterton also said, you say grace before meals, all right, but I also say grace before the concert and the opera and grace before the play and the pantomime and grace before I open a book and grace before sketching and painting and swimming and fencing and boxing and walking and playing and dancing and grace before I drop pen to ink. In other words, he says grace is, is his defining, uh, uh, gratitude is his defining characteristic. The farmer in Jesus' parable could have had a different story if he was grateful. And, and he might have thought about giving a bonus to his laborers. You know, he didn't, he didn't bring in this crop all by himself. Uh, but there's no gratitude here mentioned for anyone who was a part of this process for him. You ever stop to think about how much your life is enriched by other people? I enjoy oatmeal in the morning. And think about oatmeal for a moment. Oats from Iowa, walnuts from California, sugar from Brazil, water from the spigot, a uh, bowl made from Massachusetts. I, I, I looked around all my different objects for my oatmeal bowl. So when you eat, when I, I ate my oatmeal, I'm thankful to the farmers in Iowa, to the miners, to the manufacturers, to the well drillers and the plumbers. All these people had some part to play in having oatmeal for breakfast. We're foolish if we're not grateful for the ways other people enrich our lives. Amen. We're blessed by so many people. So, he, so maybe, maybe this is the problem. No gratitude. The second thing I want to mention is that he puts his faith in the wrong place. He's got security because he has grain in the barn. What, what would you say today? Money in the bank. It's amazing how 2,000 years pass and so little changes. We put the words in God we trust on our money, but really it seems as if, as if it's in money we trust. Someone once said that John D. Rockefeller, the founder of Standard Oil, the first multinational corporation in his day, the richest man in the world. In fact, it's been estimated that by today's standard, counting for inflation, he would be worth $340 billion. That's 340 times that lottery that came through last weekend. More than four times what Bill Gates has, who's the richest man in the world today. Rockefeller seemed to have all the money in the world. Asked one time, how many millions does it take to be happy? How much more do you want? Rockefeller said, one more million. One more. There's no satisfaction. It's as if when, you, when you're caught up in the greed, you're drinking from an enchanted well that always leaves you thirsty for more. Like Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Because I try and I try. He's, he's wanting more and more caught up in this, in, this, in this feeling of greed. And one of the problems with looking for security from money is it distorts our values. USA Today had a poll some time ago asking, what would you do for a million dollars? 42% of those polled said that they would be willing, 42%, that's almost half, 42% of people polled said they'd be willing to do one of these four things for a million bucks. They'd be willing to spend two years in jail, willing to permanently move to a foreign country, willing never to see their best friend again, or willing to throw their pet off a cliff. Wow. The same, uh, 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 same kind of finding was reported in a, in a book called The Day America Told the Truth. What are you doing? In this book, it was $10 million. What are you willing to do for $10 million? 25% said they would abandon their families. 7% said they would kill a stranger for $10 million. So that's, that means in a gathering of 100 people, there's seven people there who might, sorry about that, seven people there who might consider killing you if the price was right. Isn't that crazy? What would you be willing to do for a million or 10 million? 
What was that winning lottery ticket last week? Over a billion. Jesus says you cannot serve God and money. Jesus calls us to a different way of life, a security found in a relationship with God. You know, money is so unreliable. The stock market goes up and then it goes down and down and down. You wonder when it's going to go back up again. You can't count on things like that for lasting security. The psalmist says in Psalm 18, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. As if what we count on as God's people is God. God's love, God's word, uh, God's, God's reality and presence in our lives. Paul, who suffered so much as he traveled, was uh, shipwrecked and put in prison and, and beaten and other different struggles as he traveled. Wrote to the Romans, he said, who can separate us? None of this stuff. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Do you remember the response? No. In all things, we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. For we are sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, and all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. So maybe he's a fool because he has no gratitude. Maybe he's a fool because he's looking for security in the wrong places. Uh, third, I think he's a fool because there's no sense of stewardship. No sense of thinking that, that his job was really his way of serving. If the farmer had been serving God, maybe this would have been different. If the farmer, during his morning prayers, as he said, the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done, he might have been thinking, Lord, what would you have me to do with this abundance? How should I use this abundance? Should I use this income to start another business? Should I expand the operation and hire more people to help more people in the future? Maybe should I make a donation to the synagogue, to the local church? And if his work was his way of service, and obviously he's a very good farmer, maybe retirement isn't what God wants him to do. Maybe God is blessing him and wants him, instead of thinking, I'm going to build a big barn and, and relax, Maybe God is blessing him so that he can continue to be a blessing to other people, continue using his farming talents to, uh, to hire servants and, and uh, help the community. In one of John Wesley's more famous quotes, the founder of the Methodist Church, he said, whoops, not there yet. I'm going to get you hungry for pizza in a minute. Uh, Wesley said, do all the good you can by all the means you can and all the ways you can in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. And in a sermon on money, John Wesley said, make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Friends, if the farmer had been a Methodist, he might have been at least tithing his income and uh, kept on working, and, and maybe his story would have come out differently. Now to the, to the pizza picture. One of the greatest examples of stewardship that I ever came across personally was Rose Totino of Totino's Pizza. I came in contact, it's a little bit of an overstatement, I heard her make a speech one time at a college. Uh, Rose Totino and her husband started the pizza business in Minneapolis in 1951, and pizza wasn't very big then. In fact, she had the person in the bank, she went in, in to get a loan to start her business, their business. Uh, the banker didn't know what a pizza was. And so she made him a pizza and brought it in, and, and, and you didn't use that as collateral, but at least explain what the operation's all about. Well, what made her unique in business was that Rose developed a dough that could be frozen, and would, when frozen and then reheated, would still taste good. And this formula for this nice dough was then later on sold to Pillsbury, and her whole operation sold to Pillsbury in 1981 for $22 million, which was a lot of money back then. Uh, in the 70s, Tortino's frozen pizza was the top-selling frozen pizza in the United States, and she became Pillsbury's first ever female vice president. Well, Rose gave a lot to charity, to, mental, to a mental health center for adolescents in her hometown of Fridley, Minnesota, and made church repairs and, and a new school in her mother's hometown of, of Scorpolio, Italy. 
and was very generous to a college I attended two quarters at at Northwest Christian College in Roseville, Minnesota. And that's where I heard her speak. She made a donation to the school and uh, was there for the ribbon cut cutting and for this uh, uh, dedication of this building. And in her dedication, she was asked about her generosity and complimented for her generosity, to which she responded, have you ever seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it? You ever seen a hearse with a U-Haul behind it? And her point, of course, is what? You can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. She thought of her being blessed was a way for her to be a blessing to other people. Friends, it's foolish to think to see work as just for us. Wisdom comes when seeing our work, our labor, as a way to make a difference in the world and serve God in the world. Someone said what, what we have is God's gift to us. What we do with our gifts are our gifts to God. Lastly, uh, there's that quote from Wesley. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, in all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Amen. John Wesley. Bill Williams has this on one of his shirts. I, I, I saw that the other day. Amen. Lastly, this farmer is short-sighted. He's thinking only about comfort in the here and now, and no thought at all about the hereafter. He's preparing barns for wheat, but he's not really preparing his soul for heaven. Notice the language that God addresses the man with. He doesn't say, you're going to die tonight. He doesn't say, you're going to come to an end tonight. He doesn't say, you're going to kick the bucket tonight. None of these words. He says, your life will be required from you tonight. The word in Greek is, is, uh, it, it literally is to mean to man back, to demand back, to require back. And it has this sense that even our life itself is a gift from God. And that God was, was taking, was calling that in, was taking that back from this man that, that night. So when the day comes, what kind of accounting will we give? The preacher poet Lon Woodrum, I heard him and talked to him when I was a freshman in college. He has a poem about this parable. It goes like this. Arranging blueprints of big barns to catch the flood of coming corn, Computing stuff stored for the future, he forgot that time is not stored up like grain. Big barns buy no tomorrows. His soul required by him who causes the grain to grow, discerned a question hanging over the barns, blueprints, and miles of corn. Whose shall these things be? Jesus said, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. What then, friends, does life consist in? Life consists of gratitude toward God. Life consists in looking to God for your security and looking to God in faith. Life consists in making the most of your opportunities here as a prelude to serving God in the hereafter. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, we are indeed grateful for this breath of life you give us. We're grateful for the talents that we have. We're grateful for the opportunities that the days we have give us to make the most of our talents. We pray, dear Lord, that all of us in this coming week might see ourselves as stewards of blessings. That we might be grateful for your love and goodness. And that we might use all we have your glory and your honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I mentioned at uh, the beginning of the sermon, if you all have a word or two you wanted to add to this, you're welcome to, to move this way. Otherwise, we're going to do our, our last hymn in just a moment. <clears throat> we did this at the lakeside service a few weeks ago, but it's a little easier because you only had to take three steps to get to the microphone <laughs> at the lake. Our last hymn is that beautiful one, Let There Be Peace on Earth. The hymnal uses the word with God as our creator. We're going to use the traditional language with God as our father today. Let's stand, please, and sing together. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. 
let there be peace on earth and peace that was meant to be with God as our Father. In perfect harmony, let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. Each moment and live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Amen. Amen. And I didn't say it, but Mike, but it's so good to have you back with us here this morning. Blessing to have all y'all with us here today, too. Uh, hear now the words of the benediction. Go forth in peace. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.